Uh, my name is Polamy Desai. And what are you involved in? Ah, well, um, let's see. Um, multiplicity of um, arts and exploration and experimental arts. So that goes from photography to performance to running a gallery space and studios. Um, what else do I do? Beg for commissions, um, pirate things, modify things, um, and grassroots activism, I suppose. It's a mixture of stuff. But originally you were involved in some sort of theatre as well? Originally I was involved with um, uh, live art, performance and poetry, which then became more structured into theatre in terms of traditional theatre. Yeah. And then I heard you reinvented yourself. Did I? Yes, oh, that's what I heard. Okay, I didn't hear that. Um, who told you that? Ah. <laughs> okay, somebody else told you I was mad. So anyway, um, well, I, don't, I wouldn't view it as that about reinventing. I, I never had to reinvent. Um, yeah, that's a weird one. Um, very odd. Um, no, it's not a Madonna complex or something. Um, or a Lady Gaga complex of reinvention. No, I'm just who I am, evolving as most human beings do. Yeah. And you were born in the UK? Yep, I was born in Hackney. Okay, and but your parents are from here as well? Mm, well, my mum likes to think she's from here, a Londoner, completely, through and through. Um, no, my mum is originally from Bombay, but her family's from Bombay and Gujarat, um, but she was born in Uganda, um, like many people were in transit and things. And my dad's from Gujarat and a mixture of other things, so, yeah. So did your mother play a big role in helping you form your artistic journey? Um, I wouldn't say my mother played a role. I think this, I'd have to describe it in terms of the two generations of family that I'm actually familiar with, um, in terms of having met them and discussed things with them, and the stories that surround both sides of the family. I mean, it's generally from my mother's side, um, although my father played an influence as well uh, because of his own interests and activities and his existential angst and crises. And, um, but my mother's side was um, pretty much quite different for its own time because my grandmother ran away from a very privileged converted Christian background to join the Irish Samajist movement at the turn of the 20th century um, to fight the British and stuff. And she ran away from home at 16, taking a little sister with her. So all these things were influences. And her sister married a guy called Kamishwa Rao, who was an anarchist who fought in the Spanish Civil War as well and was with Bhagat Singh. And so it was this history of people with not much money, um, a great deal of idealism, um, aspiration um, for change in society and of that, and reflected its time. Um, and that obviously influenced um, my grandmother's children. Um, and my grandfather, in fact, on my mother's side, was a linguist and a scholar who unfortunately died very young, but he went to Montpellier University on a scholarship. So he, again, it was in the, in the 30s, great change in Europe, you know. Um, so the context of that, I mean, there was this idea, the Bolshevik Revolution had happened, you know, the, when you think about international politics, this affected the whole world. Um, so yeah, the First World War, let alone the Second World War. So this, this is a big influence on ordinary people's lives, working class people's lives, poor people's lives as well, um, who had this notion that knowledge is king as such, or queen or whatever, and you need to gain knowledge. So all of that affected my upbringing. Um, and for its time, for her time, my grandmother also fought against sexism and was, would have considered herself a feminist as such. Um, yeah. It's a, it's, a weird, <clears throat> it's a weird relationship. I'm slightly ambivalent with all of this as well, because it's an amazing history, um, which has only been written about now, in a way, the personal history. But it's also couched with a lot of abuse and violence and um, reflective, I suppose, of wider society. So, so how did you crystallise all this into um, a particular career 
form? Well, sometimes I think I, I didn't actually make a conscious decision. I, I decided I was going to rebel against my parents who wanted me to do philosophy, French, um, art, etc., theatre, and I decided to do sciences. So, again, it's a bit unusual. Um, and, in fact, what happened was I ended up being, when my parents divorced, um, I ended up coming to um, this area at the tender age of eight, um, Harrow, um, which was just full of the National Front um, everywhere. Posters, leaflets, all sorts of stuff. So um, I was actually looking for alternatives, even at that tender age. And my mum had involved me with writing, poetry, automatic writing, all sorts of weird, wonderful stuff, concrete poetry, music, um, sciences. Um, you know, I used to go to the Science Museum at the age of 10 on my own and stuff and look at stuff and draw. And So I was really lucky. There was this earnest... I suppose what, what they did give me um, was this earnest thirst to, for curiosity, questioning, context as well. Um, uh, you know, because I suppose the family had been involved in fighting the British and stuff, and there was this sensibility of justice and liberation and um, context of where we are and why we're here, and not just us, but an internationalist perspective. Um, so, what did you say, by the way? <laughs> I was bringing it back to the point. Um, how did you crystallise Oh, how did I crystallise it? Well, it's a mixture of... Um, Wanting to follow that, I was trying to look for other people who were similar to me. Um, and that was a gradual process. In the meantime, my mum was already taking me to the sort of um, alternative sort of poetry things or whatever. I used to go to things which John LaRose, the poet, used to um, recite at. I met Stuart Hall when I was a kid, for example, Professor Stuart Hall. Um, and there was this whole scene in London, it being London as well, I'm sure it happened in other cities as well of poets, writers. I suppose they'd be considered the intelligentsia, but these were people from um, the diaspora, you know. Um, well, not from the diaspora, sorry. They, they were in the diaspora, um, but from the majority world, from previously colonised places who were already organising here. Professor Stuart Hall had already set up um, the Free University in the East End. So there were lots of people who mingled, you know, music people as well, and... So I, as a kid, I was taken to those things. Um, and my auntie lived in Soho, so I had this other backdrop to the sleaze of London as well as a kid. So it was, very, it was about curiosity and questioning. Um, so I think my journey started there, of being brought to Harrow in a way, and looking for other people, and continuing to perform and write and stuff, and being encouraged to do so. And then I made contact, actually, with Hurdi al Rai at the Commonwealth Institute when I was reciting... Um, one of those sort of teenage angst poems, but it was really weird and really sinister and dark. Um, and he came up to me and said, oh, do you fancy you setting up a theatre company? I shouldn't really try and mimic him, actually. Sorry, Hulga. Um, uh, yeah, so to set up a theatre company and stuff, and I just went naively, yeah. And I was 13 at the time. And so we set up Hounslow Arts Co-op and... It ended up being a fanzine, Talk Token Black. We had about, at its height, we had about 100 people in it. We had a band called um, the Marassis, who were sort of this wild, funk, come punk, David Bowie-esque band, I don't know what. Um, yeah, um, we had a theatre company, community theatre company. Um, it was all in Hounslow, West London. Um, so I used to go via South Hall and Butters. So it, those things start to happen. So I was already involved. Um, so by the time I was choosing to do sciences as such, anyway, um, we got a grant and to do touring. So it was a bit like running away to the circus in a way, but it was with the theatre company. So part of the theatre company actually became professional, equity recognised, ITC recognised. So it became a rep tour in theatre company. Um, in the meantime, yeah, we, I think we had loads of bands, poet, live poetry, crazy avant-garde poetry outfits. Um, we had visual artists mixing, up, mixing it up with people doing sound stuff. Um, by that time, I suppose punk had happened, so we were sort of post-punk influenced in a way. And most of us, as far as I'm aware, most of us, well, I hadn't, I never got to university or anything, so most of us were totally 
um, in formal terms, uneducated as such. So it was we were bringing a naivety to it, but also we were bringing quite a strong street politics to it because of the racism that was going on. And we were also confronting at that age, you know, it was called homophobia later in a way, but you know, we were talking about um, the fact that there was anti-gay stuff around and we were talking about sexuality and gender, feminism, sexism in society. Um, and I was very fortunate to have met kindred spirits in a way. Um, and I would say that probably all of us learn from each other. So that opportunity came and in a way that crystallised me, that, those journeys. And in the meantime, I was also in a punk band as well and there was stuff going on locally where I lived. So I was involved with things like that and um, large scale mural paintings and all sorts of other things with friends. Um, yeah, and yeah. Um, that sounds probably, wonderful. Probably shouldn't really talk about some of the other stuff and bands and stuff and yeah, there was a lot of other stuff that I was involved with, sort of on the punk scene, but that, which I, was generally white people, but it was all cool and activists as well. And you spoke about the National Front here. That, did that mean that you had to position yourself into a sort of South Asian category or bracket? Did you um, go into that to empower yourself, or did you break out of it, or did you reject it? How did that happen, or did anything like that happen? Well, I've never, I've always said, I've always still maintained that I don't have a sort of emotional connection, some sort of sentimental emotional connection to this word South Asian. I think I recognise it very much in its political context. It's a necessary um, term to be able to relate with other people, to relate historically. Um, and that changes because we've gone through, what, Indian to South Asian, Indian subcontinent, British, South Asian, British Asian, whatever, whatever. Black, I mean, you know, one of the strongest terms for us at a certain time was the word black, political black. Um, and what that meant was being quite involved in activism, um, as well as recognising the society you live in, what's gone on before, the historical context of it, and trying to relate to people who'd had a similar sense of generations that had come under colonial and imperial rule, and having that internationalist perspective. So I didn't have a personal sense of it, but there was this, you know, at the end of the day, there was the, the way we were perceived, and especially with the Ugandan Asians coming, so, you know, post-60s, um, and post anybody that did actually realise that there were also, you know, the, the, the book, Eyes, Lush Girls and Princes, for example, Rosina Vishram's book that came out much later. I mean, some people did go to the British Library and look at these histories, that there were Lush Girls here and stuff, but that wasn't popular knowledge. So generally, I think after the Southall uprisings, what happened in Toxteth as well, Liverpool, and all even the smaller ones, St Paul's was, Bristol was the first one. I think there was this sense of how do we organise um, how do we, how do we actually say that actually this South, say South Asian men and their position in society at that time in the seventies or precede in that, if we take the arts for example and the complete invisibility and the the casual racism, you know, very casual racism or the orientalisation that was still going on, um, it hadn't really changed much, you know, in two hundred years since the whole Oriental movement and everything as well. Um, so I think these categories, or even saying feminist, you know, um, they were just they were necessary tools to be able to engage with people around shared ideas, not necessarily ideology, but shared ideas of our linkages with each other, um, and it's shorthand as well. I mean, there's a difference. You know, you could go into what was the difference between Mirburi. Um, uh, Mirburi Pakistanis, or they would talk about Sileti Bangladeshis as opposed to somebody else coming from Dhaka, you know, class differences or whatever, or background differences. And that did matter, depending on where people had come, for example, in the North, say, Bolton, some of the textile mills. You know, it did matter where people came from and how they were treated and the positions they found themselves in. But they were shared, so I suppose the people who worked in some of the factories in Southall the Punjabi Sikhs who were working in the factories in Southall did have a relationship with the textile workers who were generally from Bangladesh and Bolton. You know, and it was a, a political sense of how there can be a relation as South Asians. Yeah. So all this, I I these speak. complexities that you've been through or you've experienced and you know about 
and engaged in and, and lived within. How did that drive your own artistic journey? Um, well, I think it's, I think, I can't say that it was, it, it was, it was one aspect of it. Um, and on the other hand, finding out about mathematicians like Ramanujan or whatever, or Jagjit Sundar Bose, you know, of Bose speakers fame and everything, and their relationship, well, Bose's relationship with Marconi, say, and his, historically thinking about these things, or what's his name? Is it Satyendra Bose, the physicist who worked with Einstein? The more that one discovered all those things, um, those were drivers as well. And well, also what was drivers for people that I knew. I mean, there were also artists like Gustav Metzger, you know, experimental artist, John Latham, who was challenging stuff. Um, writers like Jermaine Greer, you know. I didn't make a lot of distinction. To me, it was this thing, the world's the oyster. And you take bits from here, bits from there. Um, the punk movement was extremely important. There were very few South Asians in the punk movement. And there was problems with that, with Susie and the Banshees and Sid Vicious wearing swastikas. You know, so there were punks that I knew, didn't get on with, who wore swastikas. And they totally didn't get it. They thought they were being shocking. And I thought it was a load of bollocks, really. You know, um, they weren't being shocking. They were being absolutely anti-Semitic. They were falling to those things, didn't care what the influences were. However, the sense of the attitude of you could do it yourself. You don't need to go to, you know, into academia. You know, knowledge is there if you decide to reach out for it and find out and experience it. Um, those were drivers. So it was ideas that were drivers. Um, Professor Stuart Hall, I suppose, because he'd been an influence in that way, was a great driver. Individuals like that. Um, people who gave us the community centre free of charge and said welcomed us. Um, and I've forgotten his name, Chandan, or whatever his name is, he used to run Hounslow Multicultural Centre and set it up. A guy like that, you know, I mean, most people would say, oh, he's a traditional guy, he won't let you in. And these were people that, you know, we took it for granted in a way. We weren't surprised that an older person, an older Asian man would let these crazy punks, you know, a, a partially Asian but mixed multiracial punks come in and do um, things with swearing and sex and sexuality and politics and um, attitude and questioning generations, questioning um, authority. You know, generally we would question authority and people who said they'd represent them, you know, representing communities, that was the other thing. So these were all drivers, you know, ideas as well. Um, looking at constellations in the, in the sky were, you know, yeah. So how do you feel about the more traditional South Asian theatre and how that has developed in this country? What, do you want to describe what you mean by um, this, this is what we're This is what we're trying to find out yeah. in, this, in this project. So obviously different people have different uh, descriptions or understandings yeah. of what it means. But um, from what you were saying to me, it seems that you are not easily categorizable mm -hmm. and don't wish to be. And therefore, would some, even though you did s help to set up a theatre group and that sort of thing, did this thing sit comfortably within your own ethos or not? What, the traditional, mm, the sense more, of the traditional, more, or do you mean...? More kind of a traditional contemporary, maybe, or...? Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think... I mean, it's difficult to say, because at the time, I'm trying to remember what it felt like at the time, um, as opposed to the reflection now, because it's easy for me to say on reflection now, all those different poets, people I've mentioned earlier to you um, that were writing as well, and theatre people that were writing at the time, different companies that had set up, um, like Cara, and I'm trying to remember the rest of them <laughs> now. Anyway, or many others that I, f I can't re recall the names. There were many others. Um, British Asian, back, Batuk, British Asian Theatre Company, that was it, BATC, I think it was, yeah. And people, I mean, they all had their place. It wasn't a problem. I know that some people in Hack, some individuals, I wasn't really, I didn't see it as we have to break them because they were doing contemporary works and questioning things um, within frameworks and structures of a sensibility of their own, which also had an association with 
back home as such. I think what my problem was at the time that it almost felt like we were seen as either the white sheep by some or the black sheep or washing our dirty laundry in public. I'm, I won't say who said that, which really annoyed me because they didn't see that we also had a connection directly with avant-garde theatre from the 50s, the 40s in India or Kenya, you know, which people, like my mum were doing. You know, my mum was reading Anton in Alto, you know, and stuff. It, so th that was my problem with it, with some individuals. But um, they couldn't see that connection that we had um, with back home as such. That was my only problem. But other than that, no, I didn't, have a, I didn't really have a problem with it. I know some individuals in our different multiplicity of companies and everything did have a thing about doing the... Indian accent or the Asian accent. That was always a big debate um, to provide authenticity with, you know, and especially when an actor doesn't have it, um, or they talk like that, and then suddenly they're trying to do, you know, a particular accent, because how do you do the village, the region, the whatever? And I always thought it was quite funny. I mean, I sort of viewed it almost like a Pythonesque thing. You know, so to me, it was these were like Pythoness characters, or um, you know, the Three Stooges, or whatever, or something weird was going on there, um, or Marx Brothers. You know, although I also related to the Peter Sellers thing. You know, the, the, the birthday party. You know, where he does this accent, and some of those accents weren't that dissimilar. You know, um, in a weird sort of ironic way. Um, so I think it's, it's the context and the trajectory, because um, I remember reading, say, Girish Garnard's plays, you know, and they were, they were fantastic. And I think I remember seeing, what was the Peter Brook version? What was it called? Mahabharat with, um, I've forgotten, Malika Sarabhai was in it, I think, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And there were bits in it which are absolutely sublime, you know. So it's what you take from it. It's no different to say the idea of opera trying to have an authentic scene in a way, or the national at the time trying to do a particular accent um, in a way, although it, it meant more to us because we were already being called packies. So how do you break those things in a way? Um, but maybe that tension was good, you know, looking back on it, that tension was good and people learnt from those and did other things and um, but, the, you know, I never believed there was so, such a thing as authenticity, so it seemed pastiche sometimes or whatever, but then pastiche, there's characters in Indian theatre which are pastiches, so it seems to have a connection with that, but yeah. And what about the content of these things? Well, some of the bits I remember was a bit like where we used to have this joke about Hindi cinema, or Indian cinema as it was called, why is there always a rape scene? <laughs> you know, or the characters or females and stuff. Some of that was there for us. And, um, and I think because we were a different generation, you know, we were a different generation. And although my personal life, in terms of the people my mother was like, they were a generation preceding some of those theatre people, and they thought it was stupid, you know, in a way, having those characters. So it was trying to find really strong female characters. So when Carly Theatre came along and some of the stories that were told, but these are just, these are one-off stories. There's many more to tell. It's a myriad and these are ongoing and they, sh they shift and they change and the emphasis is different. And maybe, I think, one of the difficulties that we had within Hack, we didn't value ourselves, which was problematic. One of the things that's, that didn't sit easy with me was what was going on there, where there were people who were trained or people who went to uni or had some academic background or came from middle-class families who had opportunities, which a lot of us in Hack didn't. I mean, I had knowledge and education, a different type of education, but there wasn't a lot of money. Um, and that was for a lot of us in Hack. Um, but the, the problem was we were almost at loggerheads because of that there was a class difference, I felt. Um, and also, I think, what was I going to say? Um, there wasn't a recognition, there wasn't a value put to us by those theatre people, which was really problematic looking back on it. And therefore, we didn't value ourselves. So it was a, in a way, nobody understood us. You know, why avant as such? Some of them that I work with today, in fact, or whatever, or free improvisers or whatever, um, say to me, oh, why didn't we know about your stuff then? I said, because you weren't interested, you know. 
it took us a long time until our 20s for, to get the audiences that we were getting. So in a way, even the weirdest white people who were into weird theatre or performance didn't get us or didn't want, weren't interested because they just thought it was another Asian thing. And the Asians didn't get us. And then we weren't valued by... We were also doing visual arts, so we weren't valued by any of those people. So our history has been almost completely invisibilised. And we didn't value ourselves, so we didn't record ourselves properly. You know, we were doing street theatre in Southall and all sorts of stuff, and very little of that, you know, um, exists because we just didn't value it. And nobody else did in, a way, in many ways until um, much later. So that that's, didn't sit well with my ethos now. And you mentioned audiences. What yeah. kind of audiences did you have? Right in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I said there weren't many people. It depends where we did it. Um, we sometimes, when we used to make a joke later on that we'd, we'd do weddings, bar mitzvahs, funerals, whatever. Um, yeah, um, baptisms, anything. But early days of early community theatre hack, we did used to perform a lot in a place called Cranford Community School and Centre. Um, because the youth worker there, actually he did believe in us, he was a youth worker there, um, and let us use the space. So we used to have a lot of families used to come and absolutely love what we did, this radical stuff. But when we performed sometimes in places like Southampton when we went on tour, literally some of the elders as such would stop us midway and even got into the local papers, which was quite a thrill for us. Um, and, yeah, of being outrageous or, you know, um, offensive or what have you. And we weren't deliberately out there to shop. We were just telling stories about our lives of things we knew, things we believed in, um, and things we were influenced by. Um, uh, yeah, so, so, so we did have this weird type of audiences. Um, and then sometimes we were doing quite serious work. Literally, there were sometimes... Um, it, not, not necessarily on a stage, that, was, that came a bit later. But in some of the places that we did, there'd be more of us performing than there were audiences. But that's quite typical of experimental theatre. So in a way, if we, would take, if we were to take some of the people who believe in experimental theatre, in a way we were more real than the ones who get loads of audiences, in fact, because we're so obscure, you know. Um, although we didn't think of it at the time, we were very disappointed and sad. Um, but later on, when we were resident at Waterman's Art Centre and the tours got bigger, yeah, I mean, it, it was just full houses as well. And, but they had to be nurtured, and things were changing as well. More people were doing what we were doing, who happened to be Asian. Um, also, there was this wider sense that television had changed, you know. There'd been this big leap from the days of... Frankie Howard and then the racist comedians whose name Bernard Manning stuff, you know. We were, we were doing that stuff while Bernard Manning was still on telly, you know. Thatcher was in government, you know, and stuff. So it was early days in a way. I mean, Thatcher was still the bane of our lives, but at least we still had the dole in a way. Um, the benefit system, to a certain extent, you know, helped us compared to today. Um, so, so this is all that context. Um, it was a very different time. I mean, the Sex Pistols, when they went on telly and tried to be all shocking and everything on that program, it was it made headline newspapers. People were appalled. Um, National Front, as I said, you know, were up and down marching and um, for many years. Um, so anyway, things had changed by the '90s and stuff. Um, television, you know, lots of things had changed in wider culture. So there just were newer audiences, um, and I think. A bit like the way the Tate Modern changed people's perception of contemporary visual art or art generally. And nowadays people will walk into it and go, oh, yes, you know, and have some sensibility to it, go into the shop, read the books. They have an association with it, even though they might still say it's crap or they don't understand it. But conceptual art got changed a lot with the Tate Modern in this country. So in a way, I suppose for us, in terms of performance theatre, there was a lot going on that changed. Um, I think live art performance, you know, with more festivals happening around live art performance helped that change. Um, writers were writing differently. I remember, I mean, I'm probably going totally on different tangents in terms of some historical proper timeline, but I remember Sarah Kane's play, I think that was a bit later, um, about the former Yugoslavia, you know, that 
was a marked time as well. Um, yeah, um, I'm trying to think of plays that came under the South Asian banner as such as well. They, that was changing because then they were going to the West End. So, you know, by that time people were looking for not necessarily staying within um, smaller theatres, but what can you do in the West End? Um, how do you reach out to wider audiences? Um, people like Gurin the Chadda made, what's it called? Baji on the Beach, films like that. And I was more interested in what a, a filmmaker like Alia Saeed was doing, for example. You know, because um, I think the more experimental makers who come from, whether it's South Asian backgrounds or people like John O'Comfra or whatever, I think that should be part of popular culture. You know, I don't think there should be a deconstruction or this thing, let's play to the masses. Because the masses have complex lives. They have weird people in their families. They have weird histories. You know, we, can, we find that through oral history telling. And I think trying to go to the lowest common denominator for the sake of it. It's fine if you just want your salary or you want to make money out of it. Yes, but okay, that's a job. But you don't have to do it. You know, um, as we've seen today, experimental filmmakers. You know, um, I've forgotten her name now. Great performer, Marcia Farker. We were recently talking about this. She's won a living wage. Not necessarily a capitalist one. Want a living wage. Um, but those people come from different ideologies, maybe, or backgrounds. And it's more about the art and what they're pursuing and how they want to share that with people rather than the career, I suppose, or whatever. You know. There's a mixture, I suppose. I'm just trying to think of oh, radical, radical films in Hollywood. You know, yeah, there's, there's been that, but yeah. yeah. So coming back to you, yeah. with all these changes that you're talking about, how has your work evolved? Oh, well, I suppose I haven't even talked about technology and the speed of technology. You know, um, not so much access, but even its impact. Because just even having, I think about this sometimes, where even in the 80s and early 90s, there was this whole talk about how technology was going to democratise the world. And forgetting that, you know, half the world doesn't even have access to electricity or clean water or, you know, uh, let alone sewage. So, but the impact of that has happened whether that's through surveillance control, um, access as well, or what pornography. Um, and things like Twitter, you know, if I'm bringing it much more up to date, although that's been around for years as well now. Um, things like Twitter in times of crisis or protest, um, activism, th that speed in which mobile phones, the fact that, okay, you might not have access to electricity, but you've got access to a mobile phone, how that's changed people's lives. I mean, really poor people's lives and how they get paid, for example. Those all those wider considerations have had an impact. Um, I suppose what, what, one of the things that I've gone back to, in a way, is setting up USERP, which is, again, picking a place which didn't have a gallery, public gallery space, and nothing artist-led, and setting it up in this part of northwest London, um, and we're here right now, hence we've got the cars and very Cajun. Um, it's all about what we can hear as well um, around us. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a space for artists, it's a space for audiences, it's a space for participants. Um, it's very much about trying out new things, but also USERP Art is also about um, providing a space for, um, as they're termed, service users from charities here because generally they tend to do things like bead making sitting in Costas or Starbucks or somewhere. So we've also attempted to be a space where people can come and learn about um, both, both the traditional technical sides of performance and art and um, visual art and sound art and music, but also an experimental place to try out different contemporary ways of um, doing things and perception and um, how we perceive how, or the scientific basis of it as well and yeah and alternative ways of thinking looking a bit of John Berger mixed in with Kathy Acker maybe and I don't know um, yeah and politics as well yeah and what kind of people make up your users here uh, well we've got um, we've got about 40 associate artists and stuff from all different walks, from Oni Das, who's in Asian Dove Foundation, 
to uh, people like Steve Beresford, who's a free improviser, so it's mixed. Um, the audiences we've had, when we were really open in terms of the exhibitions we were doing, events on nearly every night, um, we, were, we had over about 12,000 people in two years. Um, we've, it's totally mixed. And it, it reflects Harrow in terms of we've got about 60% um, BME, BAME population here. Um, a, a lot of them are Asian. It's, it's changing again in terms of it used to be Gujarati Hindu and its mixtures. Um, yeah, it's, it's a total mixture. Um, and it challenges probably everything around stereotypes about everybody, really. Um, yeah, we have quite religious practicing people talking to queer people here in one night. Um, and uh, they might have a fight afterwards, but, it, you know, they, they, it's a place of dialogue as well, which has been interesting to do because it's Harrow. It's the suburbs, and most people would do this somewhere like Hoxton or Dalston or King's Cross or NoHo, as it's called. Um, and we've decided to do it here, which makes it quite special, really. Um, and we're not currently funded, so anybody wants to fund us. Um, but be, be, by being that different, it's now resulted where we go on tour next year with Stuart Lee, a comedian and performer, something I've curated, um, Steve Beresford, pre-improviser, Tanya Chen, an amazing, brilliant pianist, um, virtuoso contemporary pianist, and so is Steve Beresford. Um, Simon Underwood, who circuit bends and used to be in a, a mad post-punk band, um, quite well-known one. Seth Ayers, look, I'm doing promotion here, thank you guys. Um, Seth Ayers, um, who plays um, electronics, uh, sound artist, um, and plays a lot of Arabic instruments, and a guy called Jagbot, who's originally from South India, who's here, who's a programmer, has created this beautiful synth software, and me on my prepared guitar. And that's the unusual mixtures that happens to be to do with performance, and John Cage, um, because we're doing a John Cage piece as well, and improvisers, but it sort of epitomises the outlook that I still have, really, that openness, you know. So a lot of um, South Asian theatre here is based on narrative. Yeah. And your work doesn't necessarily, um, you know, have a narrative at all. And it has a sorts of narrative, but it's maybe not a conventional narrative. Well, tell us about that. I suppose. Huh. I suppose I would call it, maybe I'd have to call it a living narrative in a way. Um, because there are... There are purposes, and if I see, if I try to look at it as a whole, rather than a specific piece um, of work, you know, or even my photographic exhibitions, they have had a narrative in it, a definite narrative in it, both visual and textual based, because text is part of it. In terms of the performance pieces that I've done, which I haven't done for quite a while actually, They've also had a narrative in it, but maybe they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily clear, conventional, gestural um, indicators or text based, you know, um, oral um, indicators in a way. Um, certainly, our hack stuff that we used to do was very narrative based, some of it. You know, there were plays, you know, there was a narrative in it. And sometimes there was a distinctly, there was a distinct storyteller as well within it. Um, I suppose in the wider sense, yes, I was trying to say, when I look at it as a whole, in a way there's a narrative of the struggle to actually break out of things. You know, it's a different sense of narrative that I'm trying to bring to it, I suppose. Or I'm even not even sticking to the definition of what you're trying to get to. <laughs> so. I'm interested in your concept of narrative. Okay. That was off the cuff when I was trying to think. Okay. Uh, but which yeah. is what you are. Off the cuff is what you are. Naturally, it's just like analyst now. Okay, <laughs> right. Yeah. So, with with the whole concept of narrative, um, and you, it seemed that a lot of this narrative does inform your work, from what you said. Mm -hmm. um, could you give us more of an example of how this narrative works in your work? Oh gosh, I wish I hadn't said that. Now. Okay. Um, I suppose, in a way, it's 
maybe it's more related to storytelling in a way, you know, and those anecdotes and storytelling in a way that people do. Um, I suppose for me, in a way, it is, a, it is also about historical narrative, both more recent, personal, and wider. So it is in, it's, it's about human history as well. So that great grand um, narrative, um, for me, is still there. Um, so I suppose I have different heads, I have different dimensions, in a way, of how I view it. Um, the, the, the long-term narrative has actually changed for me as well, by the way, I just realised recently, um, with the unfortunate death of somebody that I admired and worked with and set up the first um, HIV AIDS foundation in India with. Um, so that's had a huge impact. So in a way, that's made certain narratives change in my life. Um, I see it as more conceptual, in a way, and I see it as relational as well. But I suppose if we were going to go back to theatre or South Asian theatre specifically, there are, there are definite narratives in there which people break. Now, I've got to admit, I haven't seen... Um, oh, no, I saw... I've forgotten his name. Rifko Arts, their production recently. Because I had a free ticket. Um, but I haven't seen a lot of South Asian plays for a long time. I've seen South Asian live performers. So I don't really, I don't really know whether their narratives have changed within... The performance, so I shouldn't really talk about that. That's not what you asked me to talk about. You asked me to talk about my narrative, and I'm skirting around the issue. Um, yeah, I said about storytelling. Um, maybe I'm trying to break narratives of it. Maybe it's 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 because I'm dislocated in many ways. Um, so I spent years doing photographic exhibitions, and now I'm performing again, but doing different types of performance. And there's a narrative within that performance that I do. Um, there is purpose in there, there is a direction in there, there's a sense of trying to tell a story within it, and there's a sense of attempting to question some of the characters in a way that I'm displaying within that. Um, I haven't quite worked out what that is yet, that's all. It's still exploratory to me, but there, it's, there is a definite sense of why I've picked the sitar and why I've done what I've done to it, and everything set, every Everything I've done to it has been purposeful on one hand, and then it, I've experimented with the sound within that. But physically, visually, it's been purposeful, and what I do with it is purposeful, in a way, which is in the context of, I suppose, breaking ideas of the sacred, um, this reverence given um, to the idea of what you can do with a musical instrument. Sometimes people revere musical instruments more than they revere human beings, um, which is problematic. The fact that you know a lot of instruments, Asian instruments, um, are, are related to the heavens. You know, um, I, in Hindu stuff, you know, you see that visually. You know, um, the Vina with Saraswati or whatever. Um, uh, so there's this whole sacred bond with it as well. Um, so in a way I'm consciously breaking that sacred bond and bringing it back to this is an instrument made out of wood it comes from the earth, it will go back to the earth finally and that's what it is and, and because I'm saving broken instruments and getting sitars from schools which did have NF scratched on them and stuff so it's saving them so there's this other sense of recycling these commodities into making them something else which um, aren't completely different to what they were originally, but bringing them with a new life. I think also this sensibility of what I am aware, because only, only because of what people say to me as an Asian woman doing that. You know, what are you doing? How come you're doing that? And how come you're playing it like that? When I have done a performance just using my hair on the sitar and it's head banging and it's punk and... And it's having a, a deliberate nod, no pun intended, a deliberate nod to that sensibility. Um, but it's purposeful. It's not supposed to be ironic or a pastiche or anything. It is also about exploring the sound, that physical sound, um, with that physical movement that I'm doing and what that creates on this instrument, um, which does have sacred bonds with... Indian goddesses, etc. Um, so that's an exploratory narrative that I'm doing, in a way, if that makes any sense. 
And for those people who have never seen your prepared sitter, could you explain to us what you do with the instrument physically? To well, there's, I've got a few, um, but the particular one that, um, that was really in bad condition and had a broken gourd and it couldn't be fixed, um, what I physically did with it um, was I decided I wanted to play the inside of it because it, to me, is very similar in a way, you know, with the gourd and the curvature, and um, it looks both both female, a bit like a, a Bunsen burner would in a way, you know, it has that curve. Um, but also I wanted to play the inside of it, to, to hear the inside of how it resonates. So I removed the gourd completely, um, which was probably the first, I mean, somebody would think of it as a violation. And in a way, I suppose I was thinking about violations on female bodies, etc. You know, some of these engines and instruments have been compared to female bodies and, you know, some gurus have said, you play it like this or that. Um, and I've changed some of the strings um, because I like, it was quite a simple aesthetic choice, actually. Um, I like the sound of a string or, that I'd heard on a goteng. Um, it's, it was a particular Korean goteng, so I changed that. I preferred that sound. I wanted to add a toy to it because I perform with somebody in a duo sometimes who modifies toys. So I wanted to add my own toy to it. Um, so I've modified it with a toy that actually makes a noise, which happens to be a black Barbie doll. An Asian, I think, Barbie doll with blue hair. And this thing of the body, again, I'm going back to the body of the star, the body of the instrument. And this iconic figure, this impossible, ridiculous figure of the Barbie, which is continually still being sold. Um, and, yeah. Um, so I've done various things to it. Um, I've changed, yeah, I've changed strings. Um, I, I sometimes stick to Ravi Shankar's tuning or sort of Viliad Khan's tuning, or I just tune it according to mood, depending on where I'm playing. And it's augmented as well, so I've attached um, fishing wire to it as well that I bow and play. Um, I've extended it into electronics as well, so the sitar sound influences and triggers another sound, like the modified stylophone or it goes through a voice changer that's been modified, so you get a very different sense. But there's always a sensibility somewhere of that immediate recognition of that sitar sound somewhere in it. So sometimes when I'm playing it, I'm thinking, I'm literally imagining thinking of all that's been lost, even within musical history or um, South Asian history, the lost histories of the people who were radical or whatever, you know, um, or people who also broke out the mold, you know, cause the Guru Shishya thing has been questioned, both by Gurus and Shishyas, you know, but a lot of that still isn't necessarily common knowledge in this country or of who broke that mold, you know, what, who questioned what, who questioned, really questioned um, the parameters of the rag, say, you know, um, and not just for the sake of it, but who has a conceptual link with that. So sometimes I'm thinking about that. Um, but generally, it's a, very, it's a very moving instrument for me. And it, it's because it's, there's always a stereotype still associated with you know, Indian restaurants and sitars. You know, there's this hark in the back. Although that's all changed now with modern, you know, Asian restaurants and everything. That's still changed. But there are still some stereotypes. Maybe I'm longing for those days. I don't know. <laughs> so, but in a nutshell, it, it's, it's some things to do with that and some things just to do with also perspectives of making your own instruments which it's, uh, or modifying instruments um, which when you're using so-called Western instruments um, it's been much more common to do um, like the breaking of pianos you know grand pianos which some pianists find that really frightening but there are pieces made on that you know um, yeah so in a sense that's that's quite traumatic. What actually happens to a music instrument um, if it's prepared in a particular way can be a traumatic experience um, for, for the people. Well, for who, the instrument. <laughs> you know, for people who perceive the instrument yeah. as a particular way. And that kind of traumatic experience must feed richly into your work. Um. Well, I've been, I've had very few negative comments, actually, and they tend to come from non-Asians. Um, in fact, on YouTube and stuff, it's, there's various 
gurus of sitar schools who've, you know, actually love the sound. They're listening to the sound and going beyond the, the physicality of um, what I've done to it. Um, or what I'm attempting to do is extricate something else out of this, which is ostensibly this particular one that I'm using at the moment, which I've taken the gourd out of. It's ostensibly a discarded student sitar. I think that's where the trauma ended. I'm trying to rejuvenate it in a way. So the trauma aspect of it which is somebody else's trauma, I'm not taking on board because I see this as a rejuvenation of something, an exploration of something else, and I give it the greatest of respect, in fact. Um, probably more so than the thousands of sitars that are probably lying around in attics right now that I'd like to get my hands on, um, you know, which people thought they were going to do lessons and then they forgot about it, you know, and didn't. I mean, what's worse, you know? Although I'm not that, I'm not sentimental. It's an instrument, you know, instruments break, Instruments get destroyed, it's instruments. You know, what's worrying is golden dawn in Greece, you know, and thank God some have been arrested. You know, what's worrying is if we get another Rwanda, you know. Um, what's worrying is the displacement of people to do with the Olympics of China and the after effects of that. What's worrying is the immigration shit that we had in Britain recently, you know. Um, that's of concern. That's the trauma. Therein lies the trauma of... Um, living, existential, humanistic, living, you know, um, that's where the trauma lies for me, really, I suppose. In a sense, um, what you do with your music is symbolic, sounds to me, like what you do with the rest of your art. Symbolic of, what do you um, think? Well, the, the use of trauma in a, a very symbolic way. I think my photographic work has been that, more so. Because even the context of where I'm performing, um, the context of where I'm performing is much more of a conceptual link with free improvisation and notated music and noise music and that context. So it's more a musical... I mean, there's trauma within that, but it, it's more the trauma that the individual musicians bring maybe to it, or confusion or emotion or whatever, or conceptual links to if it is notated music or the parameters that you can play in, that's a very different way of approach. I think within my photographic work, there's, de there's definite links to trauma in there, both personal as well as wider senses of the documentation of that um, and the hidden traumatic things within that. Yes, that, that, that is definitely there in my um, photographic work. Um, yeah. And what about in your theatrical work or dramatic work? I don't do that much theatre anymore, I've got to say, which is why it's great to do this video. <laughs> um, but in the past, yeah, absolutely. Um, both solo work, um, performance work, um, and with Hack, which was the main company, and then we had the Dejalebis, which was a spoof thrash metal band. Um, that was real suffering, that one. That was real serious suffering. Um, and the sycophantic sponge bunch, I mustn't forget. That was more about trying to inflict suffering onto people. Um, yeah, um, I wouldn't say that. I mean, hacks definitely dealt with trauma. Um, but it was, a, it was beyond just the self. It wasn't necessarily this where the ego is. I mean, obviously, we have them. <coughs> uh, sorry. Um, but it was the wider sense of human trauma, you know, the human condition. I mean, that's what Hack was about, the human condition, really. You know, where is it at? You know, is this cycle of suffering going to carry on? I mean, you know, it was teenage angst in a way, but on the other hand, also the recognition that actually everything that has changed, humans are still evolving, everything that's changed has happened through struggle, mainly poor people, working class people, internationally struggling. Every single really definitive, best changes that have been made have happened through that. Um, not necessarily, I mean, they may have gone hand in hand with the philanthropists who've been remembered, you know, um, but generally it's been because people struggle. Those are the forgotten histories as well. You know, some people complain to me, oh, Asian history has been forgotten, oh, black history has been forgotten, Afro Caribbean. Yes, it has, but white working class histories have been forgotten, a lot of that. And we've getting general stuff now. You know, we are getting general stuff, and it is in museums, but it tends to be like 
what was the living room like in the 1920s? You know, it's still there, rather than these very personal radical histories. Um, they're being lost. Um, yeah, um, let me think. South, I'll come back to South Asian theatre and performance. Um, well, should we talk about a specific moment? Maybe, I don't know. That's up that to you. Useful. Oh, okay. I don't know. I'm trying to remember anything. <laughs> I just know, I just, well, I suppose one thing I would like to add is that I think it was an incredible time. It was an incredible time. So, but well, to end up, would you say any one specific memory for you might represent this, what you're just talking about best? Oh, no, I don't think I can. There's too many moments. And there's ongoing ones. I mean, it's also what, what I've gone to see or experience subsequently, you know, not just in this country, but in Japan, in India. Um, I mean, I think I mentioned earlier off camera about Chandralekha's work, for example. Um, you know, a, a, a massive influence. Um, and, her, you know, things that have happened subsequently, what people have done subsequently. And I suppose it's now, uh, it's... I'm, I suppose, personally, I'm more interested in what people are doing outside of the venues, the traditional venues, in a way, but how they can also articulate some of the things they want to share outside. Of, I mean, I haven't even talked about cinema, you know, cinema and theatre and how they've influenced each other um, and the, the impact of films, um, incredibly so. I mean, one of the biggest mass media, which is now translated into YouTube, of course. So, you know... Um, that, that is an incredible uh, experience, but it's, it's overwhelming, I suppose. So coming back to memories, well, um, there's been too many, actually. There's far too many. And I wouldn't want to say one production or one particular, per one director's piece of work. There's been a lot. And there's been moments within each, each thing either witnessed or participated. There are moments within which um, are precious and... And no, I wouldn't say life changing, but they're added. They're added to the change. They're added to the continual dialogue that goes on. I suppose. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you very okay, much. Thank you.